Thanks so much, Nikki. I'm really excited to be here to give this webinar. Um, as Nikki mentioned, my name is Tony Perez. You can find me online at Perez Box. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Security. I'm also responsible for GoDaddy Security Product Group. Um, and as she mentioned today, we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper into our hack report. For those that are unaware, we've been doing this for the past couple of years. Um, and what's really cool is that you can kind of start seeing this trend and this change over time. There's a lot of consistency, but it gives us a lot of things to talk about. It's just a nice way to recap. And so um, that's what we're going to do. It's important to note that all the information we're going to share is specifically to the Security brand, right? So Security brand is one of the things I'm responsible for. Later in the year, I'll be doing a more holistic one for all of GoDaddy. Uh, but I can almost guarantee you there's going to be a lot of similarities into what we're seeing. So with that, um, this year's report, we took a representative sample of our entire base that came out to about 25,466 different infected websites. Of those, which is really interesting, is the number of files we had to clean, about four and a half million. And that'll make a little bit more sense as we kind of dive deeper into the presentation. Um, as we traditionally do, we're going to kind of talk four distinct topics, kind of, hey, what were the most affected open source CMS applications? Um, what were some of the risks associated with outdated CMSs? And kind of how am I thinking about that? How is our, our business thinking about that? Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll dive into the analysis, blacklist analysis, and what those engines are and what that means to you as a website owner. And then finally, we'll kind of talk, dive a little bit deeper into the malware families. We won't go too deep into that. Um, for that, I'd bring some of the smart guys on. Uh, you know, I'm just a pretty face in this thing. And so uh, with that, let's kind of dive into the CMS security. So what did we see? Um, as we've seen in previous years, WordPress continues to be a very big piece of our base and it continues to grow. Um, and, and, and that's okay. I mean, this is pretty representative of what we're seeing on the web. Um, right now, I think last I checked, uh, WordPress is with about 33 and a half, 34% market share in terms of all the websites, about 60, 65% of CMS specifically. So when you do the math on that and you start kind of looking at it, it makes sense for the distribution to be the way it is. Um, what is what continues to be interesting, at least to me, is kind of where does um, Magento and other online commerce like PrestaShop, OpenCart sit? Um, and that'll make more sense as we kind of dive deeper into the conversation. With that, let's dive into kind of uh, some of the changes. So we did see some fluctuation. Um, again, though, uh, this is not representative of the platform being more or less secure. It was just kind of it's such a big platform, so dominant in the space, that it's expected to see this kind of distribution. Um, we did see some modest drops in Magento, some more significant drops in Joomla, a little bit of a rise in Drupal. Um, but again, because this is representative of our base, maybe that's just more, hey, this is kind of what our customer base looks like. And you can see kind of the ebbs and flows of our you know, engagement in different communities or how different communities might be leveraging us or promoting us to their customers. Um, so it's just, it's insightful to look at it and think through it that way. Let's look at it from those lenses. Um, one common theme we did have, which is, and it continues to be for year and year, year, year out, is you know, <clears throat> it's not so much the platforms themselves that are the problem as much as it is the kind of the connected ecosystem, these third party components uh, that make up the greater platform. At least that is the case for platforms like WordPress, um, has been the case for the platforms like Joomla and Drupal. Um, and we're starting to see this shift for platforms like Magento. So predominantly Magento's had more core issues um, and that's kind of been changing over the past 12 months where we're starting to see more kind of third-party extensions. So they're, trying to, they're starting to suffer the same problems that the greater CMS ecosystem has suffered for the better part of the past four or five years. Um, so, I mean, other, other contributors beyond kind of exploitation of vulnerabilities and third-party components, of course, credential stuffing, forced attacks against access control, we continue to see that. Improper deployment, security configurations, it's literally why it's number six on OWASP top 10. Um, a, a general lack of knowledge, the more people coming online, we're starting to see this very different type of user um, or website owner. Um, what we did want to add, though, is we didn't include this in the hack report, but I wanted to make sure to cover, on, cover it on this, and I'll be writing an article on this. It's kind of like we always talk about third-party extensions, but what does that really mean? What does it look like? So we went back and we analyzed what we, what we specifically as an organization analyzed in 2018, um, and we saw that about 196 different uh, vulnerabilities that we identified as an organization, and maybe we didn't publicize them, but we did a lot of engagements with, directly with WordPress.org and some of the other repos, as well as some of the developers. What's kind of really interesting to me, and it's kind of a little bit of a shift, is you know, in all of 2018, of all the analysis we do and all the connections we have, we saw about 20 severe vulnerabilities in WordPress plugins in the third-party ecosystem. 
in Q1 of 2019, we're actually already 50% of where we were in all of 2018. It's kind of, we don't have we don't have a good pulse on why and what's going on with that just yet. I mean, this reminds me back in 2014, 2013, when we were kind of starting to really disclose a lot of the vulnerabilities and, and some very, very severe issues. Um, and so we're still trying to get to the bottom of this and hopefully we'll have a little bit more insights as, as I work with Mark Alexander and Feel to understand what's going on in the threat landscape. But this is something interesting for us to keep in mind of. Um, one thing we are seeing though, it's not always just about the vulnerabilities in the plugins, but also about attacking the supply chain. I mean, we just saw an amazing research uh, by folks on pit digging uh, and what they were doing as an organization intentionally, right? Using it to DDoS competitors, redirecting users. We literally just saw an attack this week against MailGuard where a plugin was redirecting users um, to a different site maliciously, right? In, in, in unbeknownst to the actual website owner. I mean, attacking the supply chain is actually a really, really big problem that I anticipate will continue to be abused as more of the websites, kind of like a big infrastructure, as more infrastructure applies all these controls to mitigate attacks to their network and it gets really hard, we start going for the weak area. So if you're leveraging plugins, um, understanding the changes that are happening in there and understanding that the reputable sources become even more important. So with that, let's dive a little bit into some of the CMS analysis. Um, what we noticed, which was about 56% of the sites we worked on were up to date. That's pretty cool. 40%, uh, 44% of them were out of date. But so this doesn't really tell us a story. And so what we do is we kind of dive a little bit deeper and we'll say, okay, which platform specifically? Um, as you can see, coincidentally, while WordPress is, makes up a big piece of our base, um, it's out of, out of date state is a lot less than almost any other CMS. Um, and there's specific reasons for this that I'll talk to it about in a second. Um, what, I actually, what I also look at is I look at things like Magento and OpenCart and PrestaShop. And why those are so important is because while the representation of the base is really, really small, um, they actually make up a very big percentage of online GMV or, or market value, right? Because these guys are or these organizations are generating serious dollars. They're pushing out um, products, services, goods. Um, and they also have an obligation to be up to date in accordance to being PCI since they are online commerce. So that is a little bit concerning. Um, what's actually also really interesting about this is that when you look at some of these platforms to the right versus the platforms to the left, you start seeing things like uh, they, they lack backwards compatibility. They don't have auto update features, things like that. And so that's why when we look at things like WordPress, we start seeing, wow, they're really leading the way in this because you can see the dramatic impact that they had over the past few years with their implementation of auto updates. So huge shout out to the WordPress core team. And we started to see other CMSs start to kind of have this conversation. We've also seen uh, what happens in platforms like Joomla where you don't have that backwards compatibility and then all of a sudden it becomes really, really difficult um, to update. So we, we saw a modest drop of about 3% in from 2017 in terms of um, the out of day state of WordPress. Now, understand what this is, what we're talking about here is when the infection comes to us and when we work on the site, we take a note of that and we take a tick and we say, <laughs> is it up to date or is it out of date? And that's what we're talking about here. Um, but this also complements or supports um, some of our analysis where um, the greatest threat, at least for platforms like WordPress, is specifically um, uh, the third party's ecosystem. Joomla is a little bit of a different story, right? I mean, we saw a pretty interesting rise in the out of date state of Joomla. Um, and that just, you know, the way I look at it is as the platform continues to progress and evolve, the lack of focus on backwards compatibility actually has a material impact on users, right? Um, all of a sudden there's no clean way to make that progress. And so you have a lot more of, well, I don't wanna make an update because I don't know what's gonna happen and it's gonna break and I don't want to risk my site being down for whatever reason. Um, so it's, it's something worth keeping in mind and, and, and taking a look at it. And this is specific, you know, when you have issues like this, couple that, so Joomla, like WordPress, um, has a third party ecosystem problem, but it also has the same problems that Magento has, which is has core issues as well, or severe core issues. Speaking of which, um, when we look at Magento, we did see a rise in out of date state, but what's kind of interesting and Willem's lab kind of talks about this really nicely. He's a, he's a great researcher that focuses a lot of en energy in Magento. He says, you know, when he looks backwards in time, Magento has had um, some pretty significant core issues. Uh, and that's been the thing that people exploit. 
Uh, but what he's starting to see is this trend, at least starting around uh, fall of 2018, where um, he started to see uh, more and more third-party extensions being um, exploited and being used as a vector to get into the applications, right? And so what you're seeing is this shift. So WordPress has been here for a couple of years now. You see Magento following the same suit. As the platform gets more secure with Magento and Adobe and what they're doing, now it's this entire third-party ecosystem. And, and this kind of relates, I think, to all all CMSs, and it's kind of worth as, as an organization looking at that and saying, well, how can we help improve that, that dynamic, right? Because every ecosystem is kind of working in their own little silos. Um, so if you're using Magento, uh, uh, Willem and his team and a bunch of researchers have put out some really good resources for you to analyze your existing environment, look at your modules, see which ones are out of date, which ones are potentially vulnerable, and help provide some better visibility. My biggest concern here are things like PCI, online commerce, and the fact that specifically for platforms like Magento, um, which is very similar to Drupal, is to websites, but Magento is to online commerce, which is large enterprises are using it, pushing serious GMV through it. Um, we need to be having a more serious conversation on how we're going to get ahead of, of some of these threats. Let's dive a little bit into blacklist analysis. Um, so if you're not familiar with blacklists, blacklists are organizations that have invested some level of resources to identify if a site is potentially good or bad, right? So it's a blacklist, like, oh my God, um, we've identified it for whatever reason. So Google, uh, Safe Browsing, perhaps one of the better known blacklist entities out there. And what they say is they, they have a commitment to creating a safer web. Um, and so uh, their blacklist engine uh, scans all the sites on the web that are coming online that their, their search engine finds or their crawlers find. And they say, okay, hey, um, you know, is it distributing malware? Does it look to be deceptive? Is it doing some kind of uh, search engine poisoning attack? Something along those lines. And then their whole intent is to create a safe experience for you or for me or for any of the online users. And so they say, hey, if you click on a link and it's deceptive or it's distributing malware, we're gonna tell you. and We're gonna present it with this really big red screen. And this red screen is designed to deter you from proceeding, right? Uh, so they make it really difficult. So you can click on details. Sometimes it lets you go, sometimes it doesn't. It's all about trying to create a, a safer experience, but they're not the only ones. Um, and what we've actually identified in some of our research and conversations with, and this is a bit anecdotal, right? Um, we've noticed anywhere between 85 to 95% loss in traffic when you do get blacklisted by an organization like Google. Now, so if you're a large organization, hey, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. Um, but when you're a small organization, being blacklisted and, and not allowing a customer to get to your site for an hour, it could be devastating, let alone a day or, or two days or three days. Um, so it's something to be mindful of. And it's one of the reasons that we kind of suck in uh, these blacklists. And so what we found is that about 11% of the uh, infected websites that we worked on were actually blacklisted. And you kind of scratch your head. It's like, well, why is that? Are these guys so much better? Eh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think so. I think that we just look at things a little bit differently, right? Um, and, and you'll see in a second when I start talking about some of the blacklists themselves and the differences, you'll kind of see why this is. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, one of the reasons that this distribution is the way it is is because uh, when we do our scans, we're looking not just, uh, when we're working on these infected sites, we get to see the whole world, right? We get to see what's happening on the back end, what's happening on the front end, what's evolving in the, in the landscape. Um, and so we're constantly evolving and checking. And so we get to compare like, hey, this is the real state versus the rest of the world, what's being detected. Um, so that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, oh, and if, if, you're, if you're curious and you want to read more about blacklists and what they are, we do have a link here. We have a guide that we put together. Uh, it's an educational guide that just helps you kind of walk through the process. So let's talk about the blacklist. So you, you heard me talk a lot about Google, but what's really interesting is that Google is actually the third, the fourth of the blacklists that are driving some of our detections. What's actually driving, when you look at this, to the left of this graph, you see um, a lot of the antiviruses, you know, the Nortons, the McAfee's, things that you have sitting on your notebook, right, that tell you if you have malware or not. And then to the right of it, you have like the Yad Nexus and the Googles. And then we have a few others. We have like um, Spam House, we have things like Fish Tank, things like that. Uh, but these, are, these four make up the biggest representation. They make about 40% of all blacklisted websites are coming from these four. The left two on the AV are things that hey, this site is trying to do something that we don't acknowledge on your desktop, right? These are AVs, the Nords and the McAfee's. And they have a bunch of different triggers. Speaking of which, 
None of these function the same. They all kind of sort of work similarly, but they all have their own uniqueness to it. So like, you know, uh, McAfee might be looking at reputation of your IP, while Google will specifically be looking only at malware and phishing, but they don't really care about SEO spam, right? And so you have those dynamics happening and everyone is a little bit different. And everyone, you have to do your own research. One of the things that you do have the option of doing is every one of them have the ability to, to register your site with them so that they will give you a report. So Google, you can go to Safe Search, uh, you can register with them, you can register with McAfee, you can register with Norton Safe Search, as well as Yandex. And the really interesting thing about that is if any one of them see an issue, typically they kind of say, they give you about 24, 48 hours before you have a really bad day. They're like, hey, we're about to create a really bad day for you in about 48 hours. It's in your interest to fix this. Uh, and then sometimes they'll give you a button to resubmit, re-index, things like that. So, you know, my normal advice to folks is if you know these are the four main driving blacklist entities, go and register with them, put your sites in their environments um, so that uh, you can get that advance warning. You know, more monitoring is never going to hurt you. It might drive you a little crazy, but that's okay. Um, and then one thing to note is just being removed from one doesn't necessarily mean you'll be removed from another. Now, some of these guys share APIs. And so um, if they see an issue, they might be using the Google blacklist, but if Google um, removes you, that might be one team. And then that team has to update another team and then that updates the API, right? And so like there's this entire chain. And so my advice to you is be patient, right? Have a conversation with them. Hopefully they respond. If not, you can talk to us. We'll, we have a few ways of getting things moving. Um, and then uh, just give it a little bit of time to propagate, right? It just it needs to make, make its way through the systems. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, well, let's talk about the families themselves and things that we've seen. This is kind of the, the, the funner part or the things that get exciting. So these are like, hey, what are the tactics, techniques, and procedures that attackers are doing? Like, so they compromise you, and then what? Like, what was their action on objective is what we call in the security space. Um, and so what we see is this really nice distribution of different types of malware types or, or malware family distribution. Um, and on the left-hand side, for the past couple of years, we've been talking about backdoors. Now, you know, what are backdoors? There are ways for people to bypass access control, et cetera. And I'll dive into that uh, in a couple of slides. Um, then you have things like malware, you know, these are intentional things, uh, you know, credit card scrapers, drive-by downloads, hey, you know, you're, you're infected, click this button, download a fake AV, they put a Trojan on your environment or a rat in your environment. And, and in fact, if you think back to the DNC hack of 2016, uh, it was a benign website that was distributing a malware dropper that was used to download a rat into the environment. It's so when the user went and took that notebook and put it into the DNC network, um, the, the, the rat was able to then you know, burrow into the network that way, right? That's a really great example of what happened there. Um, and then you have other things like SEO spam that continues to rise and we'll talk to that. But what I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, and, and we didn't talk about this in the hack report, but we are gonna talk about it here is crypto jacking and ransomware. So if you think back to about 2017, 2017 was a really interesting year for ransomware. We saw a lot of interesting noise happening around ransomware on notebooks, right? People abusing, um, you know, through email attachments, through website distribution, abusing um, OS software vulnerabilities, um, and infecting large organizations. Now, ransomware in the in the desktops and the notebooks is still a pretty interesting problem. We just saw Atlanta get hit by this a few months ago, right? Um, where it hasn't been very effective has been on websites. Why? Well, websites, unlike desktops, is a little bit different. You're usually on a host, and most reputable hosts will give you traditionally like 24 hours of free backups. Um, so even if you get infected, if somebody tries to steal your information, deletes it, there's usually a decent way to recover it. Now, there's a funny story there where I once des destroyed a customer's site, and thank God the customer was able to help us. Um, it's literally why they don't let me touch servers anymore. Um, in any event, uh, so ransomware just wasn't very effective. And so that, 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 that attacker base was like, well, there's no real money in it, right? So, you know, people, what attackers need is incentive, time, and motivation, right, to do it. And so if there's no incentive in terms of monetary gain, right, or social gain, then why do it? Now, enter crypto jacking. So crypto jacking is kind of interesting. So if we think back to about a year, year and a half, what we see is this 
meteoric rise in cryptocurrency, right? All of a sudden, one coin is worth $20,000. And it's like, oh my gosh. Well, what does that give us all of a sudden? That gives us incentive. That's where crypto jacking comes into play. What's really interesting about this is we've kind of seen a decline in 2018 and 2019 around crypto jacking. But that's not the full story. What's really interesting about this is when you look at how crypto jacking is and what drives it. So on the chart to the right, what you see is the black is the rise in cryptocurrency over time. And the red is the actual rise in crypto jacking. So what does that tell you? Well, all of a sudden there's direct correlation that says as the price of something goes up, the incentive to do it goes up. Why is that important? Well, as we look at the markets, this becomes a really interesting trigger or indicator that says, hey, if all of a sudden you see cryptocurrency going back up, we need to be mindful as a host, as a security company that we're gonna probably start seeing this problem. We probably need to start educating customers like, hey, there's a reason for this. Now, this also helps tackle a different conversation. So you ever had a conversation with a customer that says, hey, I don't know why anybody wants to attack me. Well, what crypto jacking does, right? It doesn't affect you as the individual, as the website owner. It doesn't affect your customers per se. It's not trying to steal their data or, or do something malicious to them. What it does do, however, is that it steals your resources. Now, if you think back to about a year ago, we talked about this around, hey, your resources are being abused for things like DDoS. So you have a website, somebody has a script in your server, they're taking that server, they're taking that script and they're attacking somebody else. We literally just saw that with PipDigging, right? So PipDigging was, hey, uh, they didn't like a competitor, so they would attack them using your resources. Great example of resource abuse and a great example of why your website's so valuable to somebody else. Um, crypto jacking is, hey, uh, in 33% of the cases that we saw with crypto mining, crypto jacking, they were abusing your server resources. Now, I can tell you from the GoDaddy side, when we sat down and looked at that, we're like, oh my God, like what is chewing up all our resourcing power, memory usage, utilization, things like that. On the flip side of that, 67% of the crypto jacking we saw was actually happening client side or via JavaScript. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, have you ever gone to a site and all of a sudden it's, hey, wait, kill page, page is not running, or all of a sudden you see a spike in utilization on your desktop? That's because the JavaScript in your browser is consuming the resources in your device. So well, it might not affect you, it might affect any of the readers. And that's just because it's so valuable, right? It's like, hey, the faster I can mine these coins, the more money I can make, right? Great example of how, hey, crypto jacking, unlike ransomware, is more effective, and we should expect to continue to see this as this entire cryptocurrency world continues to evolve and grow over time, okay? And of course, the infrastructure we provide and the, and the resources we have with our netbooks become extremely valuable to the attackers. Enough about that. Uh, just an interesting thing that I thought was worth talking about. Um, PHP backdoors. So as I mentioned, this is just a really simple way for an attacker to bypass any potential controls you might have in place. Think about it as your house. You have a house, you lock your doors, you lock your windows, but you leave your back door open, right? Maybe your dog goes in and out, et cetera. So the attacker comes in, he walks around your house, he walks in the back door, boom, he's in your house. It's exactly the same thing. So attacker comes in, just because you see their payload, maybe they drop SEO spam, or maybe they drop some malware dropper, or they did some other nefarious activity like crypto jacking, it doesn't mean that they've lost value in your environment. So what they do is they take a little file and they put it in the back door. What that allows them to do is it says, hey, I no longer have to go to your admin. I no longer have to go to your WP admin. I don't have to go to any control that you might have in place that you're trying to drive funnel. I'll just go directly to pressbox.com backdoor.php and I'll bypass all his controls and I'll log right into his environment because it'll give me all the permissions I need. That's essentially what it works like. So um, what's interesting is in 68%, right, of all the cases we looked at, we always found backdoors. And so just cleaning what you see is not enough. Um, on the malware distribution side, um, we saw a really interesting spike. And I was kind of talking to the threat team this morning, like, hey, why do we think this is happening? There wasn't a really clear answer, but what we can say is we're seeing a lot of like um, payment skimmers, right? People are trying to strip information around credit cards, you know, replacing things, putting malware in the forms to capture entries and things like that, which would explain a lot if you look at the growth of online commerce. Um, but we're still kind of diving into that. But we, we did see a really healthy growth in malware. It actually bumped SEO spam to the third spot. It used to be in the second spot. Uh, speaking of which, SEO spam or um, what I would call search engine poisoning attacks, right, is exactly as the name implies, right? So as you see on the image here on the right, uh, an attacker is, taking a, uh, is abusing um, a website and their SEO to promote whatever they're looking for. It's traditionally been known for pharma hacks, uh, which is still very prevalent today, but we also see it in things like SEO. I mean, we saw uh, uh, an SEO spam attack 
targeting student loans or, or, or student or essay writing. <laughs> so like, if you want to write an essay, go find here. And what they're doing is they leverage all these other brands. They may have marginal SEO positioning, but it just gives them an, an ability to raise their awareness on whatever they're pushing. Why is that so valuable? Well, because it's predominantly impression-based. That was one of the things that the pharma industry identified many years ago, which is they had an impression-based affiliate scheme that says, hey, all I got to do is somebody to see it, somebody to click on it, and I'm generating money. So with that alone, that explain, explains this rise that we've seen over the past three years of um, search engine poisoning uh, spam specifically. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, files that we clean, we clean in, in, in 2018. So this was kind of interesting. So we saw about a 74% increase in the total number of files. Why is this important? Well, when you clean what you think is a payload, if you write your own scripts or tools you use, you wanna make sure you're doing it as, as comprehensive a scan of your environment as possible, right? Because there are more and more files being loaded by a website by default. And so just because you remove it out of your header, maybe just remove it out of your footer or your functions file, doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get it. And when, it, when an attacker comes into your environment, they just throw up in there. It's, it's everywhere, right? I mean, 292 files by default is what we're cleaning, not even including the databases. Um, that's, that's a massive, massive, massive number. Um, and when we talk to customers and they come back and they're like, hey, I, you know, I still see this problem. I removed the payload or I continue to have reinfections. It's usually because A, they've missed things like backdoors or the payload is actually embedded uh, through a number of different files that are being loaded by default or maybe it's embedded inside the database in their, in their options files or in their widgets or whatnot um, that are causing it to render dynamically. Um, so again, yeah, it just indicates a really increase in depth of files being affected. And, and I would anticipate this will continue to, 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 to increase. Um, the three types of files hasn't really changed over the past couple of years. And I think when you look at the three types, index, um, function, WP config, it makes a lot of sense. These are some of the basic file types that we use. Index and function specifically, regardless of what uh, CMS you're using, uh, WP config being more specific to WordPress, but WordPress being so dominant in our base, it makes a lot of sense for it to be there. Uh, but a couple of interesting insights I want to call out. So the index file being affected was about 34 and a half percent of the, uh, of, of the sites had their index modified. Uh, makes a lot of sense. It's by default, one of the things that gets loaded. Um, a number of different things that we saw in here, about 24% of these files were hiding file inclusions. Um, so, you know, what they're doing is they're leveraging like hexadecimal and whatnot, trying to hide things like include, include once. Um, and then about 16% of them were using uh, uh, malicious PHP scripts. And so what they're doing is instead of uh, bringing the include inside the file itself, they're calling other files and injecting those. Um, and it just helps, uh, it makes it dif more difficult to detect it and obfuscate it. It kind of creates this chain that you have to go chase down. Um, but we saw a number of things like malware distribution, server-side scripts, DDoS scripts, mailer scripts, a a lot of phishing coming through this um, file type, black, black hat SEO and conditional redirects. A lot of these things make a lot of sense, right? This is the basic file that gets loaded. Uh, so you kind of see it's just like this soup kitchen of malware getting dropped on this file type. Um, when you look at the function files, about 13 and a half percent of them um, were, were affected in the sites that we cleaned. We predominantly saw SEO spam injections in here. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific reason for that. I'll, I need to talk to the threat team a little bit more about that, but in about 40% of the cases uh, of the function files that we cleaned were specific to SEO spam. Uh, you know, that's random content from third-party URL, injects it in the affected site, uh, able to configure it through remote command, things like that. About eight and a half percent of the functions files uh, were generic malware, a little bit different distribution than what we saw in the X file. And about seven and a half percent of the files were the php.auna specifically. And, and, and here in the in future, I'll, I'll try to get the threat analyst to come on and kind of dive deeper into this for all those that are interested in the malware specifically. Um, on the WP config, very similar to some of the system files you might find in some of the other, or the config files, excuse me, that you'll find in some of the other CMSs. Um, it's, it's extremely, uh, it's an extremely important file. It, it gives you a lot of information specific to uh, the database, uh, your salts, things like that, or configuration settings specifically for the WordPress application. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense that it would be, uh, it would be targeted. So uh, about 11 and a half percent of the things were associated with PHP malware as well. So it's being loaded, it's being called. And so uh, it's, a, it's a valuable target specifically for WordPress. And it's in here uh, because WordPress is just so dominant in our base. So with that, let's kind of recap 
what we talked about. So what did we learn? Well, about 90%, at least in our sites, were claimed by security, uh, were specifically uh, WordPress. Makes a lot of sense. It's pretty representative of what's going on in the base. Um, authorities detected about 11%, which is about a 6% drop. In my mind, I look at that and I say, hey, this is why it's so important to have different things scanning and monitoring your environments and seeing what's happening. Um, SEO spam continues to increase. It had, a, had the greatest increase, I think, in my mind uh, for 2018, where we saw about 14% moving from uh, 37% to about 51.5% um, between 2016 and now. And then general malware, interestingly enough, had a really interesting um, increase as well from 47 to 56 of about, you know, eight, eight, eight points or eight percent. Um, E-commerce continues to be something that's top of mind for me. I, I look at these platforms and I get worried about uh, how complicated it is for customers to manage these platforms. Um, they have an obligation for things like PCI, uh, but we're still seeing it very, very difficult for them to kind of tackle these issues. So um, why do they happen? Like what? Why is this thing such a thing, right? Um, and this happens for a number of different reasons. One, I, you know, when I look at it, I think that the technical aptitude required to get online these days is dramatically changing. It's a very different online ecosystem than we saw 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. Um, it's really, really easy to get online. And so these CMSs like the WordPresses, the Joomla, the Drupal's, the Magentos of the world make it easy to get online, get your content online, get your idea online, uh, get your online store online. Um, and so that makes it hard because what happens is most people don't necessarily know how to configure it correctly. They don't necessarily know how to secure it correctly. Um, and so you start seeing things like misconfigurations, right? I can't tell you the number of times that I've had conversations with customers like, but I bought a web application firewall, but it was never configured correctly. Or, it, you know, external access directly to the server was never um, controlled. Um, or we see a lot of cross-site contamination. So you have a soup kitchen server. You have all this content on the server, all these different sites. And maybe you have your online store with a blog and a main site, et cetera, um, but they're not isolated correctly. So we're not practicing basic best practices like functional isolation, right? Or um, least privilege, things like that. Um, we continue to see a lot of abuse against access control, um, you know, credit start, uh, uh, credential stuffing. Uh, in other words, trying to throw as much of the username and passwords to a login form trying to get in. We still continue to see really, really bad online hygiene. So, you know, you're using the same password across a number of different applications. Uh, that gets more complicated as we start seeing more and more organizations getting compromised, like the most recent 500 million uh, credential leak from Facebook. Um, and so, you know, these are behavioral things. You know, when I look at this, I think this is basic website maintenance. Um, and, and improper practices around website maintenance and improper um, understanding of, of basic security, understanding that it's a continuous process, it's about risk management. Um, and then a lot of people looking for absolutes. So, you know, they, they might get a false sense of security by deploying a specific security tool or specific control, but they don't understand the concept of defense in depth or defense in breadth, where you're looking at the full scope or the width, the breadth of the, of the landscape. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on. Um, in terms of the why specifically the attackers do this, well, because it's valuable. You know, I talked about um, it's valuable in the sense that I can abuse your customers. It's valuable in the sense that I can abuse you as a website owner, but it's also valuable in the sense in the form of things like crypto jacking or, or DDoS scripts or mailer scripts that I can take abuse, I can take advantage of your resources because it's still expensive to get online and do things. If I can abuse your resources and give you problems with your providers, I don't have to worry about that. I can just go on and when that shuts down, I'll just go to the next side and abuse those resources. And if that doesn't work, I'll abuse you via client side infections that allow me to take advantage of your notebook, right? Um, so there's a lot of value. There's a lot of value here for somebody to sit back and just say, hey, I'm going to attack as many websites as possible um, and do whatever I want with them and then and, and just make as much money as possible. So... What can you do to stay? What can you do to stay online? So on the right hand side here, um, I provided a couple of different articles that are really interesting and insightful. So um, uh, of course, I recommend Willem's Lab if you're a Magento platform. Um, here at Security, we've written a couple of different guides for WordPress. Uh, we'll have one for Magento coming out soon for Drupal and for Joomla. And these are just really basic guides that help you like, hey, this is how you should think about security. These are the things that are specific to your platform. Um, and so I encourage you to use them. Um, <coughs> The Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, big fan of them. They came out with their own security implementation for, for WordPress. I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, the WordPress.org repo has the same thing. Almost every platform out there has some rules or implementation guides that they've built based on best practices and feedback from the community. Take advantage of that. That's why they're there. 
Um, but a couple other tips that you think should think about, you know, of course, always try to stay as up to date as possible. If it's impossible for you to get up to date, like we've seen in some of the other platforms to the right of that chart, um, then you should be looking at other technologies. You know, cloud-based web application firewalls are definitely a technology that are being in incorporated more and more uh, because people understand that they just can't get to those updates fast enough. So what these application firewalls do is they provide you with this concept of virtual patching and virtual hardening. What that allows you to do is um, it allows you to mitigate an external attack from exploiting a potential vulnerability, whether it's a third-party component, whether it's your server, um, what we call right at the edge. So in other words, that attack never hits the origin or your server itself, right? So that just gives you a little bit more time to pressure test whatever patch came out to make sure it doesn't break, et cetera. Um, and if you're a small business, that's exactly what the technology was built for. Um, of course, I can't stress this enough. I can't tell you the number of times we've cleaned with somebody that didn't have a website, right? And so, um, I encourage you to have a website. It's the cheapest thing you can do. It's a, it's a safety net. You can get it from anywhere. You can create your own. It can be free. There's a lot of technologies out there that allow you to create your own tar balls, push it out to another server. Whatever you do, don't keep it on the same box, right? I can't tell you the number of times we've cleaned somebody. They've, a, they didn't have a backup, which was a problem, but then they had a backup and it was in the same environment. So the attacker comes in, highlights everything, deletes the whole environment, and they're like, but I had backups. And I'm like, but why did you have it in the same environment? Um, I, I'm a big fan of detection, right? Daniel has instilled that in my head time and time again. Watch what's going on. Leverage things like file integrity monitoring. Uh, look for changes. So I talked about three specific files, WP config, functions, and index. You know those are the files that get um, modified the most or attacked the most. Add some file integrity monitoring on those. So if, if a change happens, you can notify it immediately and you can kind of tackle that. Um, of course, running HTTPS, running uh, SSL TLS on your site is kind of a default these days, right? You should be running that. You should be encryption, encrypting between point A and point B. Um, but that is a very important decision. HTTPS does not secure your site. It encrypts the communication between your browser and the server. It ensures whatever you push into it gets to the server securely. So if you push crap into it, crap is going to hit your server. <laughs> but it'll be secure. Um, of course, adhere to the principles of least privilege, employ access control measures. Um, and then uh, the last one here is, you know, my, my personal favorite is employ things like um, whitelist approach. Uh, so what that does essentially, it blocks everything by default and allows only known goods. There's, there's some cool tools out there that are free, like ipauth.net, that allows you to create a, a server, a, a key, a private public pair relationship um, that allows you to quickly, uh, do like a knock and update your IP in your environment. Um, and, and that allows you to deploy a whitelist. And I, I'll write another article on that at a different time, but there are a lot of ways to do this. The biggest friction that I get from folks is like, oh my God, I can't get enough people. People are not gonna like it. I'm like, well, in some instances, that's okay. We can, you, you, we're just changing behavior a little bit um, for a bit much bigger return. Just think about it. If you do a whitelist, nobody can brute force you, <laughs> right? Unless they have your IP uh, and then know what your whitelist is. So. Um, with that, um, I will be turning this back over to Nikki, um, asking her uh, to walk me through whatever questions we might have received. So, Nikki? Great. Thank you, Tony. You did a great job. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. He's a busy man. so um, But he's here for us, and we have some questions. So let's see what we've got here. Um, what can you do if you can't update your CMS or components? Yeah, so great question. Um, so my personal opinion is there's always a way to upgrade. That being said, there are challenges. Just the other day, I was working with a small town, El Portal Village, um, where uh, they had a highly customized theme. It was on WordPress. And um, the, the, the designer was just too afraid to update, right? Because then it would take the whole site down. She didn't know how it's going to do it, et cetera. And so the, the first thing we did was we deployed a cloud-based firewall on it. Um, and from there, immediately, we stopped all the attacks. We saw all the attacks coming in. And what that did was it wasn't saying don't update. It was just saying, hey, you have a little bit more time now. Um, and let's get a plan in place to figure out how we can do the update process. Now, if you absolutely can't update, um, then I would do things like, of course, update um, – uh, I would uh, deploy a cloud-based firewall. I would also do hardening on the endpoint where I do like uh, I kill PHP execution uh, and I disable all ability to update across the entire environment. And what that's essentially doing is that most malware, most backdoor requires some form of PHP execution. And so by killing it by default, uh, it'll make it very difficult. And most sites, most teams don't require that. Uh, but you got you want to do that like that, that's a more advanced process because you can break things. Uh, but that's kind of where I would start without knowing more information. Okay, great. Um, speaking of that with updates, uh, we mentioned it or you were talking about it in the trends with e-commerce 
and yep. updating, but um, it still seems to be a thing where they're talking about they try to keep their favorite um, configuration for as long as humanly possible because they were saying, you know, updating is great. It's still things that they're going to lose money if they do yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's they're the biggest fear. Yeah, that, that's the biggest fear I hear from, um, you know, small businesses and, uh, you know, especially the online store folks, it, it, when it, when it comes to real dollars, like if it's a brochure site, you're like, ah, whatever, that's fine. I, if I break it, I break it for the most part, relatively speaking. Right. Um, on an online store, right. Nobody wants to lose those dollars. Like if, if you're generating dollars and it's performing, you know, is you like, don't touch it. <laughs> don't mess with it. You know what I mean? Whatever you do, don't cause a downtime at all. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's uh, unfortunately though, that, 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 in my opinion, is that needs to be one of those things that as a small business, as you start getting online and you start growing, you need to be taking security seriously and taking that, making that part of your everyday maintenance program uh, for the site. Okay, thanks for reiterating that. Um, we have uh, Stefan Flowers here. What is the best 2FA for my WordPress dashboard? Oh, and what is the best anti-spam plugin for WordPress? So I don't, I don't live in a world of absolutes, right? So best and worst are very relative, right? I mean, it's whatever you think. Um, so for instance, me personally, um, I use a whitelist approach. So I don't use 2FA on my website. That being said, um, when I do use uh, 2FA, I, I, I do use things like Google Authenticator. It's simple, it's easy, it works. Um, and I have Google Authenticator with a lot of my other applications. And so um, I enjoy that. Uh, in terms of spam filters, um, I think cloud-based firewalls can help. I also think that Akismet is pretty good. Um, and I use that as well. And so whether it's the best or worst, I don't know. Like, how do you measure that? <laughs> but those are two, those are the things that I do that are pretty effective and my site's been pretty good. So. Okay, good. Cool. And we have, let's see here. I think this is, uh, apologies, Maruf, I believe. After searching my site on Google, I found many results about my site with Japanese characters. Yeah. What should I do? So it's an, so this is tricky. I think Alicia wrote an article on this a couple of years back where um, people are using sites for SEO. It could mean that you're compromised. Um, it could mean somebody's just hijacking your SEO and there's different tactics for it. I need to talk to the team specifically. And so what we can do is if she shares her information with us, um, I can put her in touch with some of the analysts um, and they can give her a more accurate, um, uh, explanation of what might be going on. I know we have seen those type of attacks, uh, but uh, it, it could be an indicator that's obviously something is wrong. And so we can help her kind of think through that. Okay, good, good, good. Well, we can get that to her. Um, and I know you hear this actually with the trends that we've gone over, we'll just kind of conclude with this. The trends of 2018, what are you seeing, Tony, as possible trends for 2019? I don't see, I, you know, the past couple of years have been relatively quiet. It doesn't mean that they haven't been impactful and things haven't been happening. Um, but, you know, it's not 2013, 2014, and we're seeing mass compromises, right? I think what I'm most interested about is the, the severity of some of the vulnerabilities being disclosed. I wonder if we're kind of, a, you know, at an inflection point where either an inf inflection of new users or just the state of plugins or whatever, or extensions, when I mean, we're seeing this rise in Magento, um, all of a sudden becoming more of the third party components and then this issues in the, uh, on the number of severities in the WordPress. I kind of think about that. Um, I look at what just happened with Mailgun um, this week and I think about supply chain poisoning. It's been happening now for a couple of years. Um, and I kind of wonder where that's going to go. I wonder where more of these attacks that abuse resources like crypto jacking or DDoS scripts are going to be. Um, but I mean, I don't anticipate something material outside of maybe a, a massive compromise in a host of some kind. Um, but outside of that, I, overall, I anticipate that the CMS environments are continuing to become more secure by default. I think that that's directionally correct. I think WordPress is gonna to continue to lead the charge on that. And I would expect that more and more platforms are gonna start following suit. We've started to see more conversation in this in other environments. Um, and I don't know if 2019 will be the year that we'll see kind of backwards compatibility and upgrade issues or upgrade oppor auto upgrade opportunities. But I would say that as we get into 2020, we should start expecting that, and which will have a material impact on the web as a whole, I think. Um, and then I think we could see seeing more and more hosts integrating it as a default configuration. I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's just directionally the right way, a more secure 
by default environment, not just in CMSs, but in the hosting environment as well. Um, I think customers expect it. Uh, I think customers are getting tired. There's a little bit of fatigue going on. We're like, oh my God, how do I get my head around this stuff? Um, so that's that's kind of where my head's at in terms of moving forward. Great, great prediction there. Okay, well, that, that is um, pretty much most of the questions. If there's some others that are coming through, we've kind of got to wrap this up here. Sure. Uh, your time, appreciate it, Tony. And for everyone who attended, appreciate it being with us. I hope this was beneficial for you. Again, this is a video recording. We'll get it together for you guys, and there will be an email sent out to just our registrants. Uh, we want to see any of our webinars. They're at sakuri.net slash webinars. Uh, for anyone who joined us late as well, everything will be available. Uh, I'm going to just say my goodbyes to everyone and give you your last moment to say anything to our attendees. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at Presbox or hit us up at Security, uh, Security um, on Twitter, and we'll be happy to engage. Take care.